Good morning. Uh, my name is Paulo Sotero. I am the director of the Brazilian Institute. And on behalf of the Wilson Center, I wanted to welcome you all this morning uh, to the center is with apologies for this delayed beginning uh, due only to a confusion that I made. So let's put that out there. And uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, uh, We have this morning the honor and the pleasure to receive uh, uh, Mauro Borges Lemos. He is the president of the Brazilian Agency for Industrial Development. Uh, uh, with us also are uh, John Williamson, uh, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for in of International Economics, and uh, uh, Chris Garman, director of the Eurasia Group. Uh, both Chris and John are very dear friends, have been with us on different occasions, and I have asked them to come today and to offer comments on uh, Mauro's presentation on a very important and current topic in Brazil, which is industrial policy. Uh, I will briefly tell you that uh, Mauro Borges Lemos is an economist from the great state of Minas Gerais. Uh, he is my grandfather was from there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's really a, a very important place for us in Brazil. Actually, if you don't know, it's where the idea of freedom was born in Brazil. Uh, Minas Gerais uh, uh, produced many, many important and wonderful people. Mauro Borges is one of them. He is an economist, as I said. He has a uh, doctorate in economics from the London, London University. He did his postdoctoral work at the universities of Illinois and Paris. Uh, and uh, he has been very much involved in industrial policy, also as a general director for the Center for Regional Development and Planning uh, in Brazil. Uh, Chris Garman, that you know, is director of Eurasia, is the head of its Latin American practice and the lead analyst on Brazil. Uh, and uh, he worked in Brazil at IDESP. Uh, he uh, uh, did uh, research on central bank uh, politics in the region. Uh, and he is one of the best commentators on public policy in Brazil, in particular in the economic field. Well, John Williamson, you all probably know, he is a uh, very important economist. To us, he is particularly important because he is very associated with Brazil, <laughs> to his family. Uh, and uh, was a professor in uh, Rio for a number of years. Uh, he is uh, uh, also, obviously, as you know, an economist. Uh, and I will, uh, with the uh, studies done at a number of universities, especially as a teacher in very important also universities, in the United States and in Brazil, uh, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Princeton uh, University of York uh, in, uh, uh, in England. Uh, uh, he was an, econom uh, an economic consultant for the United Kingdom Treasury uh, and is uh, author or co-author numerous studies. Now, the issue at hand, industrial policy, I said, is very much in the current debate in Brazil. Last year, uh, in August, President Dilma Rousseff announced uh, sort of a new industrial policy consisting of measures uh, affecting four sectors. Uh, and Mauro, as president of the ABDI, has, I think, the principal responsibility of carrying out those policies. Uh, just to give you how current this 
a, a deal. How car is this in Brazil? Obviously, you hear about uh, deindustrialization in Brazil. This is no invention. Uh, if you take uh, industry participation in GDP in Brazil in the last quarter century, it dropped from about 28% to 14%. This is one of the constant uh, 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 people are constantly reminded of that. The uh, economists, policymakers, businessmen, industrialists are always putting pressure to, so we need to address this issue. I think President Rousseff agrees with that. Just this week, uh, the Minister of Finance, Guido Mantega, uh, announced a new series of initiatives. I think that Mauro will talk about those after the uh, numbers continue to show a certain weakness in industrial performance, in industry sec industrial sector performance in Brazil. So with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mauro Borges Lemos to uh, pre make his presentation. After he uh, does that, we invite John and Chris to offer comments, and then we will open for debate. Uh, thank you very much. Mauro. Good morning to all. Uh, 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 I'd like to thank uh, Paulo for this invitation. It's a pleasure being here. It's a pleasure having uh, John and, and Chris com commenting on, on that subject. I expect that they will comment on the subject, not on my speech. <laughs> it's more comfortable. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I'll try to, to, to emphasize what I think is, is, is most important. First of all, I, I will give a, a brief economic outlook of, of the uh, Brazilian economy. Uh, most of, I think, uh, of the, uh, of, of you uh, uh, know uh, the, the, the basics about Brazil, but it, I think it's worth mentioning uh, some aspects of, of this economic outlook. Then the, what, what the, uh, what we, we call industrial policy, it's a, uh, uh, a, a little bit uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, coined word. W it would be uh, innovation and manufacturing uh, a policy or the innovation development would be more suitable, perhaps. We can discuss about that. Uh, the, the, the policy performing and the opportunities for innovation uh, in and with uh, Brazil. And final remarks. Uh, I, uh, Brazil uh, is is really uh, now is becoming a m important uh, economic uh, player in the world. Uh, these figures just uh, show uh, what it means. Uh, uh, now, uh, of course, it, it puts a lot of responsibilities uh, for the country. And uh, w uh, everybody, uh, I think, here kn knows the, these figures. Then, uh, then our, uh, 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 I think, our role in, in the uh, international economic arena uh, has changed, and we know that, and we has we have to to face this uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, in the macroeconomic sen uh, scenario, uh, the, inter the interest rate shows a downward trend. That, that's a, a quite important uh, uh, trend uh, in, in, in our macroeconomic uh, scenario. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, 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 the, the, the Brazilian uh, real interest rate uh, was to be uh, very high, and uh, I think now... Uh, we have a, a steady decreasing uh, uh, trend in the real interest rate, and I think it, it's quite uh, important 
for uh, our policy. Uh, and the investment rate experiences a steady growth over the years. Uh, as you can see, uh, our forecast uh, to, uh, to 2014 uh, is 24 uh, percent of GDP. Uh, I think this this uh, this goal is very difficult to reach. It's not easy. From the uh, Brazilian standard, we are we know that we are uh, a a democracy, and, and being a democracy is not uh, so easy to uh, uh, replace, uh, for example, a, a consumption for uh, investment. Uh, that is not, that's not the case. We are not going to do that. Then to reach th this, we have to increase uh, the, the, the public uh, investment. This is the, 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 the main effort that we have to, to, uh, to make, and it, it's not easy. Then this task, I think, is, is, is very hard uh, for us. Uh, the, the public sector effort to reduce uh, the nominal deficit uh, is, is paying off. Uh, our forecast is that uh, at the end of the mandate of uh, President Dilma Rousseff, we are going to, uh, to eliminate uh, our uh, 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 public sector deficit. It means a lot from the uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, perspective uh, of uh, uh, the economic policy of Brazil. And uh, as, as most of you know, the public sector debt ha has decreased sharply from 6% to something like 36.5% of, of GDP. Uh, I think it now uh, in 2012, we go to something like 34% uh, uh, of GDP. I think that that's a, a, a great achievement for the country. And uh, uh, of course, macroeconomic stability paved the way for the 2003-2011 growth cycle, during which 17.3 uh, million new jobs uh, were created. And Brazil's unemployment level came to be one of the lowest in the world, then I think we are in a very comfortable uh, position. Of course, uh, uh, there is no free lunch. Uh, then the result that the, the real wage depression for the, the increase of real wage is, 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 is strong. And uh, to cope with that, we have to increase productivity in the economy, the labor productivity needs to increase, to cope with uh, a structural trend to uh, real wage increase. Then th this, uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's a uh, good news, but it's also an important challenge for us. And the economic cycle of growth with social inclusion fostered the expansion of the middle class. We are really uh, uh, going to be a, a, a middle class a country. I think this goal for the country is very important to become a middle class uh, country. Uh, then I, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the concrete results are, are really uh, amazing and, and for us is, uh, uh, is decisive. Without a, 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 a mass consumption society, it's very difficult to cope with, for example, the challenge of manufacturing. Manufacturing needs a large-scale internal market. Of course, uh, we have to, to be competitive abroad, but we need a, a mass consumption internal market. And this, this is, uh, uh, then is more than a, a conception of so social inclusion. Uh, it's a, a, a result is to have an, a, a, a strong internal market. The two things uh, come uh, together, you know that. And uh, 
uh, one thing that uh, was considered uh, uh, previously uh, very difficult, uh, uh, John Williamson uh, is here and he knows very well this difficulty, uh, is how to, to reduce inequality in Brazil. And uh, uh, we have uh, done a lot in the uh, recent years after a monetary stabilization with Plano Real uh, in 1994. This was, of course, this is the decisive measure. Without that, it would be possible to have what we have now. We have no illusion that is, is just is just uh, the result of uh, one government, one president mandate. is is a, a cumulative. A coherent policy that uh, uh, was able to, to give this result. We are not naive to think that this is just a, 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 a matter of politics. It's a matter of consistency of our macroeconomic policy. And, and the result is that, of course, uh, a macroeconomic policy uh, combined with social inclusion uh, can accelerate the uh, uh, the long term tendency and the uh, uh, strong reduction in, in in inequality in Brazil shows that and poverty uh, is been is not in been is wrong in the, the slide uh, eradicated due due to to the implementation of smart welfare programs uh, I like to say here that. Uh, uh, what is well known now is Bolsa Família. Bo Bolsa Família is just a small part of the uh, Brazilian welfare program. Uh, this is um, in ge uh, a general uh, misunderstanding about that. Of course, the program, uh, 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 the fact that the program is very well focused, it uh, it is very effective. But uh, uh, the the the, the uh, Brazilian welfare. Uh, uh, comes from the new constitution of 1988. That's the, the basis of, of the welfare program in Brazil. But we, have a, we are now a welfare state, no doubt about that. Of course, we are a, a developing country, but we have a, a, a very well-structured uh, 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 welfare uh, uh, programs. And Brazil experienced a, a strong growth in manufacturing in the period before the 2008 crisis, as you, you see there. But uh, after the 2010 uh, uh, recovery, that was strong, uh, manufacturing growth lagged behind other countries in 2011, as you can see. And uh, in fact, because of structural uh, uh, weakness in terms of competitiveness, the share of manufacturing in Brazil's G GDP has been reduced, as, as uh, Paulo said before. You can see the figures uh, here. And uh, uh, of course, this is uh, um, a, a source of worry. Uh, if you, you see, uh, you s you see the, 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 the figures, uh, I'd like to 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 ex ex stress the the fact that is is not a, a a very alarming figure as is in general is said. You see, after the stabilization, the monetary stabilization, nineteen uh, uh, ninety five, uh, the share of manufacturing manufacturing was sixteen point twenty five percent, and and now is. Uh, 12.44 is not uh, exactly a huge decrease because the non-tradables after the monetary stabilization uh, uh, came through. That was expected in, 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 uh, if you use any uh, sound uh, uh, economics theory. You, you know that it that, that uh, uh, would happen. The non-tradables, the relative price of non-traders would, would, would uh, uh, increase uh, 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 faster than the, the, the tradables. And the result, of course, uh, since manufact manufacturing is uh, an important part of the tradables, uh, the, the, the result is that. If you control uh, for the, the, 
the, the change in relative price, basically the share of manufacturing is the same as in 1995. Uh, 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 of course, the level, the level of the, the, the manufacturing share is low com compared with the emerging Asian countries. That, that's the problem. You see, then the, there is, uh, in fact, no novelty if you take the long-term view from the monetary stabilization in 1994. The problem is that our uh, uh, relative position in terms of the, of the manufacturing industry in the world uh, is that uh, our, uh, the, the, the weight of our manufacturing uh, industry is, uh, 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 is, uh, is, is, it is in a, a lower level in comparison with the uh, emerging Asian countries. Then uh, the, uh, th this is the, the, the level is the problem, is not the trend. The trend is quite stable, of course, uh, with the exchange rate appreciation in the last year, uh, the, 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 the last 20 years, and with the, the, the change inside the tradables. If you take account that the, the, the commodity price increased a lot in the last de decade, and if, if you discount that, you see, then the, the, the weight of manufacturing is, is, is quite uh, stable in relation to GDP. Of course, uh, with the, the increase in commodity price, uh, this also in, uh, had, had a very strong influence. Then we have two things here in this, the figures. The, the change in relative price between tradables and non-tradables uh, at the beginning of the monetary stabilization. And uh, in the last d decade, we have the, the problem, the, the, the change in relative price uh, between the, the commodities and manufacturing uh, goods. Then you, you have to take into account to, to see uh, better this data. In general, the Brazilian entrepreneurs don't see like that. I'd like to, 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 to draw attention about this point. Uh, of course, this is what I, I said before. If you compare with the emerging Asian countries, our, our uh, 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 position level in, uh, is, 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 is uh, much lower than uh, the, the position of the, the Asian countries. And the countries underperforming in manufacturing productivity growth. That, that's the problem. Then for me, th th this is the, the great problem. Uh, productivity uh, gains are not steady. Uh, uh, then uh, 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 the, the, there is no stability, uh, no steady growth in productivity in Brazil. And this, is, I think, is the serious problem that we have to face. And that is uh, uh, the idea of Plano Brasil Maior. The idea of Plano Brasil Maior, the central idea, is to face this difficulty. Then you see, uh, you, you, if, if, you, if you look uh, carefully uh, at the, the figures, you see that in, in general, uh, the increase in excess, uh, 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 the increase in produ productivity is mainly due to uh, excess capacity. For example, the last uh, increase in, in manufacturing in 2010, uh, uh, we came from the recession uh, uh, in, in, in 2009. Then we had a ASS capacity, and, and of course, uh, to, 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 to fire uh, 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 employees is, 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 is very uh, there in Brazil. It's very expensive. Then, uh, in general, the industry preserved uh, uh, the employees. Uh, then, of course, uh, the, the, the increase in, 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 pro in productivity is, is the result of excess capacity in the previous year. Then this is one uh, uh, real uh, difficulty that uh, we have. Uh, uh, a symptom of, of this difficulty is, the, uh, 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 is worry, because uh, uh, now uh, our uh, 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 co uh, current account debt is 2.3% uh, uh, of GDP from a, a surplus of 1.8% in 2004. And, uh, of course, apart from uh, 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 
uh, uh, factor services that is expected to 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 to, to account negatively to the current account uh, balance is is, is the, the stru structural uh, situation of the uh, Brazil economy because you have a lot of foreign uh, uh, capital and foreign enterprise then the, this is natural that that the factor services have a negative eff effect on the current uh, account. Uh, the problem for us is the is manufacturing here. The, the hard fact is that manufacturing exports are growing slower than imports. Then the, uh, 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 the last uh, uh, year, uh, the negative balance uh, was uh, 92 uh, uh, billion dollars of deficit. On the other hand, manufacturing competitiveness also depends on uh, value uh, creation through R&D. Uh, and Brazil still has a long way to go in that front. As you know, uh, you can see the figures. Despite the fact that R&D expansion in Brazil has been growing since 2004, but is not, the increase is not ex, uh, spectacular. Uh, the main challenge for uh, Brazil's industrial policy is to increase productivity, as I said before. Then, uh, what to, what is our di diagnosis? Uh, during the import substitution period, our prog productivity uh, uh, growth in manufacturing was basically what we call extensive growth. Why? As we, you could add new manufacturing sectors in the economy with higher produ productivity than agriculture, uh, it was possible to uh, it was possible to increase productivity by adding new sectors in the economy. Then it, that's what was the source of productivity productivity growth in Brazil at that time. During monetary stabilization, uh, the, the, the growth of productivity was based on downsizing uh, the economy, uh, uh, or the, the enterprise, uh, the manufacturing enterprise. Uh, they, uh, at that time, they gained uh, uh, the, their main uh, profit from uh, uh, financial uh, uh, floating uh, 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 and, and senoriagem. And, and the, the, the problem is that when the monetary stabili stabilization came, they have to fire a lot of employees. And there, there was a, a, a enormous effort to have a, a real manufacturing profits. And the result was to fire employees. And th that was the source of, of productivity increase at that time. Uh, and now, uh, the the only source for growing productivity in manufacturing is intensive growth driven by production efficiency and innovation. There is no way to do that. And that's the core of Brazil maior policy. We, we need to do that, otherwise we won't survive. That's why Brazil maior is not a protectionist policy. A protectionist policy wouldn't deliver that. It's clear from the figures. To, to, to have intensive uh, productivity growth, we need to be more efficient towards the best practices in manufacturing the world and to innovate. There is no uh, miracle about that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, our bottlenecks uh, uh, are clear. We need a better uh, qualification of our uh, labor force. Uh, our production uh, efficiency uh, it's lagging behind uh, Asia countries, for example. Uh, our, uh, we are uh, still now underperforming innovation. Uh, uh, energy and other uh, basic materials now are very uh, uh, costly in Brazil. This is, is a, a, a challenge that we have to face. And capital, uh, uh, so far, is, is, is very expensive in Brazil, the cost of capital. Uh, we are decreasing, as you, you have seen 
the real interest rate is decreasing as a trend, but still now the our in real interest rate, especially the long term real interest rate, is quite high in comparison with, with other uh, countries. Then, we, uh, to, to think about uh, Plano Brasil Maior, uh, we have the opportunities that uh, are uh, uh, well known. Uh, what I, I like to, to draw at attention to the fact that now we have uh, uh, clusters of uh, uh, innovating companies that can lead manufacturing upgrade. Uh, other uh, uh, Latin America uh, uh, large countries don't have that as we had. We know that. You see, it, we have something like uh, uh, 1,500 uh, world-class companies. And this is a, 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 a very important asset that we have. It's not uh, only a, a national uh, 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 enterprise. About 30% of these uh, 1,500 uh, uh, companies are foreign uh, enterprise. And from the Brazilian constitution, uh, all these companies are considered Brazilian enterprise. Uh, then, uh, of course, all the benefits that we can do in our policy is uh, towards uh, all the Brazilian enterprise. Uh, uh, despite the fact that part of them are foreign, they of course they have the right to, to receive these benefits. And uh, don't, then this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, an, an important asset that we can uh, uh, use to think about a, a, a more efficient manufacturing uh, uh, industry. We have also uh, scientific competences that can be linked to innovate, uh, innovating companies. Th this is something that is, is going on in Brazil, and we have to reinforce that. But this trend is already uh, 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 at stake, and we have to, deep, to deepen this, this, this effort. Uh, and uh, uh, now we are also, uh, uh, we can use public procurement to support the development of new technology, especially in healthcare and infrastructure project. We are uh, already doing that. We have al already some tools uh, that we have launched uh, uh, in Plano Brasil Maior last year, and we can discuss about that uh, later. The challenges. Uh, of course, the mod uh, to modernize manufacturing and, and resume productivity growth, that's the main goal, to deal with uh, currency appreciation under East Asian competition, that is, it's, it's quite a difficult uh, uh, challenge. I think uh, uh, John and, and, and Chris can help us about that, to discuss uh, that this is a, a real challenge. Uh, to accelerate investment in physical in infrastructure, we are uh, uh, doing that, we have to, to to maintain the 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 the, the, the our uh, uh, pack uh, program, uh, and I think uh, this a uh, 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 a very uh, uh, firm uh, decision of uh, our president Dilma Rousseff that uh, uh, in the improvement of infrastructure is decisive. We are now uh, giving a lot of concessions in important uh, 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 infrastructure sectors, as. Uh, 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 ports, the the uh, air airports, and so on and so forth. And then you have uh, now a, a, a huge program of of uh, concessions to the private sector in inf infrastructure. Then uh, the uh, this private public uh, arrangement. I think now uh, it's taking place. Uh, before several years trying to do that, Brazil now I think. Uh, the country has been able to to deal with that and to put uh, 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 moving uh, this effort. Uh, to leapfrog the performance of basic education, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, if I isolate one point, uh, this is the main hurdle for us, uh, and to promote professional engineering and engineering, engineering training in large scale. We, we need to have a large-scale uh, professional promotion. We are doing that, and we have to deepen that. Then the focus are already set. 
this is the we have a, a, a structural or sectoral dimension. I don't uh, go in detail here. And you have a systemic or horizontal dimension. Uh, is a cross-sectional topics. And uh, uh, at, at, uh, at the bottom, we have the sectoral uh, organization of the plan. This is, is uh, 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 we can detail uh, that if we need, of course, on the uh, 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 left, uh, uh, left side, uh, uh, we, we have the what, in fact, are the, the, the most important uh, uh, sectors. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, our uh, public-private governance uh, scheme. I, I, I won't go in, de in detail. What I'd like to say that is, 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 that is, is President Dilma Rousseff is launching the competitiveness uh, uh, councils, uh, uh, sectoral competitive councils, uh, uh, on the 3rd of April. Uh, that's a, a very important uh, goal in terms of uh, public-private governance of Plano Brasil Maior, and this launching for us, in, in symbolic terms, is quite important for the development of uh, Plano Brasil Maior. Uh, I want to go uh, in detail here in, in relation to the main actions. Uh, but uh, there is there, uh, now uh, uh, you see th this is one uh, uh, I think is the the I would say the baseline of the measures that we want to put uh, 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 in place. Uh, a set of uh, 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 tax and financial uh, measures to boost uh, manufacturing, especially. Uh, innovation technolo uh, technological development uh, with uh, 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 BNDS and um, uh, FINAP, the, the Innovating uh, Agency of Brazil. Some mo uh, measures in efficiency and productivity. This is an important program uh, of uh, the uh, Ministry of Education with the uh, National Confederation of Industry, funded by BNDS. Uh, is, uh, 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 the, the SENAI uh, uh, is an institution linked to the National Confederation of Industry. It is, is doubling uh, the enrollments uh, in, in th three years uh, based on uh, 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 training uh, uh, programs and creating uh, new uh, training centers. This is an important program for uh, uh, training in Brazil now. And the, uh, uh, finally, some opportunities. Are, uh, I think most of them are, are known here. Uh, Paulo, uh, 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 am I on, on time or it's over? Three minutes. Uh, well, uh, you see, uh, first of all, uh, in, 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 in health care, I think uh, you have a, a very important tool to promote uh, manufacturing because our uh, the, the purchasing uh, power of the government is huge. About half uh, uh, of the... the, the uh, of demand in Brazil in healthcare is from the, the, the government, uh, uh, both the, the federal government and the state government. Then this is uh, 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 an important device to develop uh, 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 innovation uh, and uh, technological uh, transfer uh, in Brazil. Uh, this is, is the, 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 the broad uh, band uh, uh, program, 90 million access points in the whole uh, uh, country, 
probably uh, in the uh, on the third on third of uh, April, uh, as I have mentioned before, President uh, Dilma Rousseff will announce this uh, uh, program. We have a, 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 a special tax regime for this program. That is very important, and it, it will be launched in on the third of April. This is the Brazilian uh, in, uh, investment plan for infrastructure. As I said before, it is going on. This is uh, uh, energy uh, uh, invest investment for the next 10 years. Uh, uh, electricity supply, oil and natural gas, uh, offer uh, liquid uh, biofuels. This is a, a Petrobras investment program, 2011-2015, uh, mainly directed to, to the, the off, offshore investments. Uh, opportunities for joint business and cooperation. Uh, well, uh, we think that uh, uh, mainly in relation to uh, the United States, we have a lot to cooperate in, in te technological terms. Uh, we have uh, 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 on our side uh, financial condition. Our problem now is not financial. We have uh, uh, what we need is technology, not financing. And uh, we, we can make arrangements uh, uh, from, uh, 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 by using uh, BNDS and FINEP, our two uh, financial agency, to do that. Then I, I think we have a lot of opportunities, then we can discuss uh, about that. Thank you very much. Um, I also uh, have a claim to Ministry of Ice. My, that's where my wife comes from. So I know Ministry of Ice quite well, and I think uh, very highly of the state. I've not been to the west of the state, but uh, I've been most other places uh, at one time or another. <coughs> um, let me say that I'm among those that were disillusioned by the uh, term industrial policy at an early age. Um, in the UK, back in the UK in the 1960s, when we had a government which announced that it was we were going to grow 4% from then on instead of 3%, which we had been growing previously and continue to grow at on average, um, despite the announcement that we had a national plan to grow at 4%. And this national plan uh, uh, basically consisted of an industrial policy of picking winners like British Leyland. Ha hands up those who heard of British Leyland. I don't see a forest of hands. Um, so uh, the, it, it disappeared a long, long time ago, before most of you were born, I suspect. Um, it, so much for the policy of picking winners. It really doesn't work very well. Um, governments aren't very good at it. The main thing that, uh, main effect that this 4% ambition had was to bring forward the planning of electricity, building of electricity stations. Because if you were going to grow fast, you had to have uh, another electricity station. And I suspect there's still, 50 years later, there's still uh, out there somewhere in the UK uh, a, a, a station that's uh, spewing out 5% more carbon dioxide than it need because we've built a year earlier than it need have been because of this intention to have a 4% growth rate. It really, uh, if in itself, it doesn't work. Um, announcing an intention uh, do doesn't wor work. Um, so... Uh, that, that was what uh, disillusioned me about industrial policy. Now, uh, my dear um, um, Paolo uh, 
Borges uh, Lemos has not used the term industrial policy very much. Um, he's talking about plano Brazil Mayor rather than industrial policy. So maybe he uh, uh, shares with me this disdain for industrial policy of the typical type. Um, recently, uh, um, Danny <coughs> Roderick has attempted to re-establish industrial policy by redefining it as an attempt to internalize externalities. That's what I'd always considered it as. Um, that's what I'd previously considered what he describes as uh, industrial policy. Well, I'm in favor of industrial policy if that's all it involves, an activist government which tries to think intelligently about whether something is needed and it then steps in to provide it. But that's really not what industrial policy was historically understood as. Uh, what can the government do to uh, uh, promote the growth rate? Well, first of all, it can have a sensible macro policy. And here I was very uh, uh, pleased with the, uh, to see that the projections had Brazil moving into an overall uh, fiscal surplus by the year 2014. I think one needs to ask, however, whether Brazil couldn't be a little more ambitious than this um, in terms of tightening up on fiscal policy so as to relax on monetary policy, so as to have those lower interest rates, which I think we all agree are still too high. There's still a real interest rate of almost 5%, which is, which is very high by international standards and explains the strength of the... Uh, well, at least if you... Uh, as long as that uh, is in existence, one shouldn't be altogether surprised to observe the strong heiau. Uh, and the fact that it's uh, squeezing out into industry in the way that uh, Mauro Borges Lemos was describing. Uh, so, so I think that one could have a, 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 an attempt to tighten fiscal policy in the short run, which would primarily, in the Brazilian context, I think it would be very, very different to the American context, uh, one would have the uh, primary emphasis there on reducing expenditure uh, because that's what has risen so rapidly in the case of Brazil and what is, uh, in the view of many of us, out of control. And so one would have to do it primarily by cutting government expenditure but on pensions in particular. Um, uh, pension reform remains an acute uh, uh, problem even after the reforms which have been introduced. Uh, there have been, um, so, so I think that's what, what's wrong with ma macro policy. I don't uh, uh, think that one can g depart very in any fundamental way from the principles of macro policy that are, were laid down by the Cardozo administration and have been followed since, but um, uh, I, I don't see them as a great problem except for this excessive uh, weight on uh, monetary uh, policy to keep inflation under control as opposed to fiscal policy. And because of that, one directly gets the high interest rates and then the strong heiau. Now, I think that the strong heiau is indeed a problem. It is responsible for the uh, part of the reduction in manufacturing in Brazil. Uh, part of it is just a secular trend. I mean, there's no question that as a c country matures, so its in industry tends to become a smaller part of the economy. It becomes more productive, but b it becomes a smaller part of the economy. And uh, the, uh, overall, uh, what uh, services expand? Um, that you see that in Europe, you see it in the United States, you see it in all industrial countries, and I think you're seeing the same thing in part is in Brazil. But in addition, there's the problem that the exchange rate is too strong, and that's uh, partly the undervaluation of uh, some of these Asian currencies, and partly it's uh, uh, due to uh, the high interest rates in Brazil. <coughs> <coughs> the other things that the government can usefully do, uh, I, I was, again, Danny Roderick, um, he, he mentioned uh, 
I've mentioned his name already, and he's come up with what I think is a very useful idea, that you should give a tax concession to people who develop a new market, who really pioneer a new market, uh, give, a tax, give some sort of support, which I, uh, to my mind, uh, the natural way to do it is due to a tax concession. But basically, the idea that innovating new markets is an important part of development, it's perhaps most key to development, and one should, uh, we in the industrial countries do it primarily by giving support to patents. Anybody who, who, who develops a patent gets a, uh, a, a benefit um, that um, uh, by being able to exclude uh, somebody from the market for a period of 15, 20 years. Um, that's not available in, typical in most developing countries. In Brazil, it's available in some industries, but not overall. There are still many of the basic industries which Brazil is attempting to develop. And I, I think that uh, that makes a great deal of sense. Uh, there really wasn't, uh, uh, an, uh, that's not part of, not part of Brazil, uh, the plan Brazil Maior, which uh, was described. Uh, I, the education part, I'm all in favor of. That's uh, sub something where a government can certainly play a, a major role. And I think that Brazil is doing, uh, it's concentrating on the right thing. It's now that it's got to universal education, it's right to concentrate on raising the quality of education, which is what uh, I the current emphasis is on. Um, <coughs> The, um, finally, let me say a few words about Brazil Maior. It's primarily it's a plan to uh, compensate for the overvaluation of AI, and I think there are better ways of tackling that, the uh, macro policy. But uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not entirely a question of. Um, uh, it, it's not entirely true that this isn't really done through protectionism. If you look down the the handout that we were given as we came in, and we saw the announced measures by, given by uh, President Rousseff in um, uh, August 2011, there was raising of applied import tariffs up to the WTO bound level. Well, you know, that's not exactly free trade action. Um, it's not a step toward free trade. It's clearly a protectionist action. The same thing is true of the new auto policy. Um, the, the same thing is true of... Um, uh, the um, the implementation of the Bi Brazilian Act um, of the Bi Brazilian Act, which is on the list, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, that those are protectionist measures. I, I, you know, they're, they're not. Some of them are quite sensible. Um, th they include things like um, uh, in increase in fighting uh, false declarations of design. Um, of false declarations of origin, I, I'm all in favor of that. You know, that should have been done anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not a protectionist program, that it doesn't have elements, important elements of protectionism contained in the program. And clearly, this is intended as a counter to the, uh, the, uh, the um, overvaluation of the Heao which is indeed a fact. It's a fact which I think is uh, going to cost Brazil dear in terms of further squeezing its manufacturing sector. Beyond the natural rate of reduction, there's this additional reduction which is caused by the exchange rate being too uh, overvalued um, <coughs> in the uh, American sense. Um <coughs> So I, I think um, uh, that's um, uh, basically what I wanted to say. Um, let me um, uh, uh, oh, let me make one other point. The attempt to raise industrial productivity, which uh, indeed uh, you rightly put the emphasis on that, um, and I think that's quite right. But you know, there was a period when uh, industrial productivity in Brazil had a spectacular increase. That was the early 90s. Um, it was actually prior to the Plano Heao when Brazil re reduced production, just coincidentally. Um, some, 
I, I think over fifty percent industrial productivity rose. It rose only in the calc uh, in the industries. It rose mainly in the industries where which were disprotected. So I can't see see uh, this reinstatement of protectionism by the back door, even if it's for a good reason, as something that is liable to raise pro industrial productivity. Uh, I think you you uh, you need. Firms to be able to compete on an even keel, um, but uh, you need them to tell them that they must compete and not to uh, come running to the government for additional subsidies, additional support when they get into trouble. Um, that is, to my mind, the big weakness of the Brazil Maior program. Thank you, Paulo, first and foremost, for the uh, the opportunity to come here and and and, uh, and discuss this this very pertinent topic uh, with uh, with two such uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers, commentators. Um, you know, as uh, as Paulo may have already made explicit in in introducing me as a speaker, I guess that what sets me apart from the rest of the panel is that I'm a political scientist rather than an economist. Um, and so when you know um, in in our firm. Uh, Eurasia Group is a political risk advisory firm, so we very much tackle the issues and try to understand, you know, the you know the policy surrounding industrial policy more from a, a policy making and, and and the politics behind it. And so I kind of wanted to structure my comments a little bit in that guise. Um, I think that from you know the one thing that really struck out at me um, in listening to to um, to the, the two presentations here um, and, and sets of comments is. You know, the one, uh, I would say, structural bottleneck to competitiveness of industry, which maybe wasn't duly emphasized. Um, I think that I would add that to the challenges for an industrial policy in Brazil, um, is the fiscal bottleneck. Right? And, uh, you know, while on the one hand you have a, uh, you know, the macroeconomic indicators have, have improved markedly, uh, debt to GDP ratios have, have declined, from an investor point of view, uh, there really is no longer a risk and, and concern over the solvency of uh, of Brazil's public uh, finances, uh, we are headed towards uh, eliminating the uh, the consolidated government deficit, as you know, as as was was made very clear. But if you look at Brazil's tax burden as a share of GDP, it has not gone down. <laughs> Actually, it has continued to go up. Right? Um, if you look at Brazil's kind of macroeconomic and economic profile, the two things that stand out in Brazil in comparison to the emerging market peers are the highest interest rates. Uh, in the world, I mean, in, in terms of the of, of of kind of the reasonable similar size emerging market economies, and one of the highest tax burdens uh, in the world, uh, in the, at least from the emerging market standard. I mean, Brazil's tax burden of shared GDP is close to uh, 36 percent, which is really OECD levels, very high by emerging market standards. Now, the two are intimately connected, right, of course, um, and uh, and so what that means is that from from a manufacturing and industry point of view, this this generate significant cost pressures um, on companies operating in Brazil, um, not only in terms of the direct taxes that they pay, but also taxes over employment. Right? I mean, as, as one of the, the measures that was highlighted here, you know, Brazil's labor legislation is, uh, is particularly oner onerous, not only in terms of the ability to, to fire and hire workers, but also the, the, the tax liabilities in, in, in a formal employee. Um, so I think that one of the, the major challenges uh, that that policymakers have in order to be able to generate conditions for higher productivity and greater competitiveness is to lower this cost pressure and to lower the tax burden. Right? Now, I want to transition into what is the political dilemma that policymakers face right now? Because if you look at Brazil over the past, let's say, 20 years, and you exclude the, the last six-year uh, period, right, at the end of the second half of uh, Lula's mandate, and also uh, the beginning of uh, President Dilma Rousseff's mandate, you can make a case that a lot of national politics were driven by the requisites of macroeconomic stabilization. Right? Broadly speaking, I think that, that Brazil you know, had significant macroeconomic vulnerabilities, a very high debt to GDP ratio. Investors very much looked at, at Brazil as, and, and to policymakers following very closely the capacity in order to be able to, to consolidate their public finances. And, uh, and if you look at the reform agenda of Fernando Henrique Cardoso on the one hand, the economic opening of the 1990s, 
the, the structural reforms that Cardoso implemented, and even President Lula's first mandate, all of them were driven by the need to reduce macroeconomic vulnerabilities, which generates the conditions to generate, to, to, to consolidate a low inflation environment and, and, and the basis for sustainable growth, right? And that specter was hanging over policymakers' heads for all that period. And that generated huge political incentives to conduct economic adjustments and push for certain reforms in Congress which are politically painful, right? So we had rounds of pension reforms, we had economic opening on the one hand, all in the name of fighting and keeping inflation low, right? And I think that that, that was a, a significant lesson of, of, of the PT when they, 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 they came into office, that, that unless they tackled this agenda wholeheartedly, the administration would be dead before it begins. Now, politically, however, the question that we should all ask is what happens when investors are no longer concerned about solvency? <laughs> when, when policymakers earnestly tackle and overcome some of these macroeconomic vulnerabilities, and there no longer is the specter of, of, uh, of kind of the market hanging over policymakers' heads on the need to conduct these adjustments, right? Um, all the, all the, the concern on fiscal solvency now is in developed markets rather than emerging markets. And what that means is, is that policymakers now have a degree of economic freedom uh, which is very new in Brazilian political history over the past 20 years. And I think that a lot of what, you know, the, the focus on the rhetoric on, on, on the return of industrial policy in Brazil and policymakers talking about the how can we in introduce competitiveness and whatnot is actually a function of the fact that you no you've, you've migrated away from an acute period of macroeconomic vulnerabilities and now policymakers can tackle this issue a bit more, uh, more, more, more aggressively. Now the dilemma, however, <laughs> is that when you can no longer make the case to the public and to Congress that we need to take painful decisions on fiscal policy, otherwise the, you know, the, uh, the risk premium will shoot to the roof, the currency will devalue, and inflation will, will roll away, it's very hard to convince policymakers to make difficult decisions on fiscal policy. You can no longer use the argument of economic terrorism that was always made in the past, right? And so what that means is, is that the capacity of policymakers to curb expenditure growth and take difficult decisions on the, the, the structural economic reforms that can generate the conditions for lower spending growth has grown politically. It's much more challenging, right? Uh, and, and as a, a famous kind of a Secretariat of, 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 of Revenue in Brazil already said, you know, Brazil's tax burden is no, neither too high nor too low. It's just sufficient to cover expenditures. And if you look at the fiscal expenditures in Brazil, a lot of them are constitutionally driven, they're ingrown, and, they and, 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 and that's why essentially tax revenue has continued to grow to be able to meet those expenditure growths. What has made all the balance, you know, uh, reasonable in order to be able to have declined debt per GDP ratios because revenue collection has also been growing much greater in comparison to GDP growth, right? So, so anyway, so the revenue collection has been accommodating these higher, higher spending growth. So I think that this is one of the structural challenges around industrial policy at the end of the day is the capacity of policymakers to deal with these fiscal dynamics and the ingrained spending and to generate the earnest conditions to alleviate the tax burden to industry, right? Now, that said, how should we understand the Plano Brasil Maior and some of the overtures towards industrial policy, right? Uh, I think that I would, I would highlight three, three components here. Number one, I think that a lot of what we're seeing is a defensive posture to try to mitigate the declining competitiveness of industry, right? Now, I understand that, you know, I, I, I'm fully on board that this is not, you know, driven merely by protectionism. I think it's really a, a multi-pronged strategy where you give ta targeted tax benefits to industry on the one hand. You give subsidized lines of credit through the BNDS on the other. You do incremental measures of protectionism. And you also try, however best you can, through incremental measures of capital control to stop the appreciation of the rail, right? So, but you're, you're, you're pulling these policy levers, however, you have limited room to maneuver because you can't really provide significant tax relief uh, in a context where you still have ingrained expenditures. And you don't want to do that uh, because that will, you know, even though you, you, you don't want to alter the declining trajectory of the, of, of the debt to GDP ratio. And this is a government as well that I think understands that you have to try to control spending growth in order to be able to, to control inflationary pressures and generate conditions for the central bank to try and lower interest rates. So you can't go about and give a lot of tax breaks to industry, compromise your fiscal targets, and therefore make inflation more difficult and the central bank can't lower rates. So, so the policymakers are kind of, they're straight-jacketed in the room to maneuver that they have. So I think that a lot of the Plano Brasil Maior, the, the initiatives are, are positive. 
but they're just not as significant or profound given these structural constraints that they're operating within, number one. Now, I would highlight that there are two new elements, at least within the broader guise of industrial policy, that, I will have that, that are significant. Number one is the significant growth and import of the BNDS, Brazil's National Development Bank, in terms of in, in the economy. And number two, I would say sector-specific measures to try to be able to generate value-added production, particularly in the extractive industries, and I would highlight particularly the oil and gas sector. Right? Now, when it comes to the BNDS, I would highlight that that disbursements from the National Development Bank grew from 40 billion reais in 2004 to close to 170 billion reais last year. All right, at least no, 100 and 146 billion reais last year. The year before last uh, was was close to 168 billion reais. So, as a share of the GDP, that's a significant increase in import. Now, in a lot of the debate around industrial policy is well, what is what it, where is the the credit being allocated from the BNDS? And rather than being allocated towards the, the incentivizing new sectors and innovation, what we've seen from the portfolio of, of, of disbursements is being allocated to sectors where Brazil is already competitive. So kind of meatpacking, cellulose, the, the, a lot of the, the, uh, of the large Brazilian national champions uh, in telecommunications through the creation of, 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 of a new, at least the merger of a, of, of a Brazilian firm. And so I think that a lot of the debate around industrial policy in Brazil, is it actually the correct strategy to, to give more incentives and, 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 and targeted uh, credit to existing sectors which are already competitive rather than focus on new ones. But I would also make the case, in, case here, and maybe we can open up for discussion, is that, that I'm, I'm convinced that the BNDS is in a turning point. Because one of the defining features in the, in the economic outlook in Brazil is that Brazil will have a significant uh, inflow of investments in infrastructure investments. In terms of forecasts for the BNDS, that is exactly where the large pipeline is going to come from. And the BNDS is going to have to fund a large portion of this infrastructure push. So I think over the next five to six years, the BNDS is going to allocate and shift their credit increasingly towards infrastructure projects and less towards industry. And in fact, if you look at the BNDS credit portfolio, you saw a significant drop in the total portfolio allocated to industry and an increase in infrastructure. And I think that that's a trend that's here to stay and, uh, and confirmed with some of the discussions I've had with members of the BNDS. And finally, I would just highlight that rather than focusing on Plano Brasil Maior and the BNDS, uh, when we talk about industrial policy, we have to look at sector-specific initiatives. And the most important one is the oil and gas industry. And here I think that there is a very ambitious program to have very high local content requirements for the oil service and gas supply chain to upstream investments. If you look at you know, where investments are coming over the next five years, you know, uh, we, we, saw, we saw the figure, $391 billion in oil and gas. It dwarfs any other sector in Brazil. So I think that, and, and, and the government has a very aggressive plan to try to create local industry to supply these upstream investments. Now this is a very controversial and uh, a policy that has material trade-offs. Because if the administration, in fact, pushes for a very high local content requirement for the oil service and gas industry, it, it is a recipe to increase the costs for upstream investments and have a slower pace of production. So there's a the fascinating trade-off here is, you know, will, will policymakers over the next five years push an industrial policy to try to develop local industry at the cost of not having a significant increase in production of oil, which means we're not going to have the fiscal windfall that policymakers are expecting. So let me just end it on that, and hopefully we can maybe open up for questions afterwards. Well, uh, I'm going to open for questions, but before I just wanted to offer Mauro an opportunity to, to react to what he heard. Actually, talking about this, which is a very nice term that Chris used, of economic terrorism, a sort of reform or die. Uh, actually, I s heard some of that in Mauro's remarks, because at some point you are describing the situation, what Plano Brasil Maior is, what are the constraints, and uh, so Brazil is running a growing current account deficit. Uh, trends are not particularly good in that regard. And say, well, we have to be innovative, we have to win this battle, we have to increase productivity, uh, because we need to do that or Brazil won't survive. I think it's pretty, as far as economic terrorism is go <laughs> goes, I think that, that uh, right, that uh, is right there. So, Mauro, uh, uh, I I'd like to offer you to briefly, if you want to comment, or if you prefer, we can go directly to the com to, 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 to questions.
Yeah, it, it's working, I think. The, the rebalancing between the fiscal uh, policy uh, and the monetary policy is, 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 is quite uh, difficult because uh, our uh, uh, main source uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the budget is the pension system, really, uh, as you said. And uh, you see uh, uh, the, uh, the reform of the public pension uh, uh, system that we are, uh, uh, President Dilma Rousseff is, is, is pushing the Congress now. Uh, the forecast is, is that the, uh, uh, the break even of the reform, if it takes place now, if the Congress approves, it now it will take 30 years for the break even of course it, it it's urgently needed to do that but uh, it's uh, more a, l a long term uh, 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 results in terms of the budget then this is a real difficulty uh, uh, because uh, at the beginning uh, possibly the, the burden will uh, increase a little bit to to shift the, the system because the government will have to put some money uh, in the 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 the, the new uh, public uh, 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 social uh, funding that is has been uh, it will be created then uh, this is a difficulty how to uh, we know that the rebalance is uh, very important as as you said uh, uh, but uh, uh, the main source of the problem is uh, uh, in terms of the budget is really the the pension the, the public pe pension system uh, if you see if you look at the the, uh, the current uh, uh, expenditure of the budget it's flat uh, uh, and the, uh, the the it is very rigid because uh, more than 80 percent of, of the current uh, 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 budget uh, is is uh, uh, wage and salaries then then it, it, it's it's, it's uh, the, the room for maneuver is is very narrow uh, to 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 cut uh, in fiscal uh, fiscal terms uh, the the current expenditure then in this the the on the other hand the the the, the cost uh, of the, the the public pension system is very high the le last year, the deficit of the public uh, uh, pension system was something like uh, 60 uh, billion reais. Despite uh, having a surplus in the private uh, pension system last year, 10, 10 billion reais, the, the, the net uh, uh, deficit was uh, 50 billion reais. The and just a, a quick comment, actually. the. The Senate approved the pension reform yesterday. They concluded oh, approval. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, that, that's a, that's good news, because this is the starting point. Yeah, good news. Uh, just explain a little bit, uh, if if one of you could, what, summing up what was approved. Yeah, no. As as Mado was saying, this is essentially uh, creates a new pension system for new entrants to the public sector. It substitutes the pay as you go uh, pension regime with mm -hmm. individual accounts. Where, where now public sector workers will only receive the, 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 the limit that private sector workers receive, and if they want anything more, they contribute up to 8% of their salary and the federal government matches. But yeah, this, as Milo said, this only comes into fiscal savings over the long run. Yeah, and as, as well, it, uh, just to clarify, that the deficit comes from the public side of the pension system, not on the private side. Yeah, yes, uh, the, the other point is, the, uh, in fact, the... Uh, uh, the, the the measures, the, the first measures of uh, Plano Brasil Maior, uh, John uh, is right, uh, was uh, uh, towards compensation of overvaluation of uh, uh, of of uh, uh, well, 
And uh, of course, it was a short run uh, measures. It's not the, the 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 basic philosophy of the plan. Uh, it's a, a long run plan. <laughs> this is just uh, uh, measures to alleviate uh, basically industry. And but some things are at stake. For example, when we uh, uh, the the part that the uh, is related to the the to exonerate uh, uh, the 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 wage burden uh, is something that we have to do uh, in structural terms. Uh, it was the just a pilot, uh, uh, just f uh, a few sectors. Probably we go now to extend that to other uh, manufacturing sectors, but uh, we have to take a, a more a decisive a, 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 a tax relief on 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 the the. On, on, on the labor cost. Th this is decisive. We have to do that, we know that this is at stake. Then when you, you put the pilot, we signaled that uh, this is needed. Then th that was the, the idea, to, 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 to point to the target that uh, the, 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 the tax relief in, the labor, in our labor cost is decisive. Then, uh, 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 of course, it's the starting point. Uh, and Chris uh, comments. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, the, the first, the, the, the des defensive posture to mitigate our evaluation is, of course, is, is the, the one uh, immediate uh, uh, aspect of the plan. That's not the, 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 the deep idea of the plan. Uh, the increasing wei uh, weight of BNDS. In fact, the, the, if, you, if, if, if you look to the, 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 the loan uh, 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 structure of, of, uh, uh, of the bank, uh, you see that this shifting to infrastructure is already taking place. Now the, the weight of in infrastructure is again increasing uh, in detriment to the, the, the manufacturing sector. Uh, then I, I don't think I don't see now that uh, the picking the winners policy uh, in terms of the bank uh, is the, the main drive of, of the loan uh, uh, policy. I don't think so because the in fact the needs of in infrastructure is overwhelming, and I think it, it will take place. And, and finally, uh, the development of the uh, supply. Chain, the, you, you gave the uh, example of oil and gas. Uh, the trade off is at stake all the time. That's the, the idea of the policy. The, a, a manufacturing uh, policy for uh, developing uh, supply chain is it, it's all a, a problem of a, a trade off between increasing production costs and the long run uh, payoff of developing uh, uh, the supply chain. Then uh, I, I think it, this is not easy. We have to do that all the time. You, have to, uh, uh, you, 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 you can't uh, 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 be naive about that. Uh, the metric is, is the monitoring of, of, uh, of the target. Is, uh, you see, I, I think we have to be very, uh, 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 we have to use parsimony to do that, you see. Uh, uh, we know that, for example, oil and gas is a wood industry. We have to take it, this into account. The automotive industry is a world industry. Then it, it's a naive thinking that we have all the parts and components being produced uh, internal to Brazil. We, we don't ex expect that. We know that outsourcing is a, a very decisive a competitive tool for uh, all these uh, sectors, <coughs> all these companies which uh, run uh, and compete uh, in these sectors, then uh, uh, is, is, is rightly a question of trade-off. Uh, I think we have to look at that. We don't, uh, I think the, 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 uh, what uh, Mexico or Venezuela uh, have done about that is, is wrong. I think we don't think that is the, the right thing to do. Uh, the Brazilian government uh, wants to have a competitive supply chain 
é, 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 é structure in, in the country é, and uh, we will do that but of course we have to, to use parsimony to do that because the trade off is all the time at stake then it, it's not, it's a nonsense if we go to increase uh, the the cost of uh, uh, extracting uh, uh, oil from the, the from uh, from the subsea it, it doesn't make sense then the, but the, 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 we have to do that and 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 be careful about this trade off thank you very much thank you well let's start with questions there let's uh, first one let's go first here yes there no 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 the, the follow the Thanks. order okay no. Okay. R Rodrigo Valderrama, Plantation International. I wonder if um, you mentioned briefly the uh, foreign exchange uh, level, uh, the currency level, and how is that affecting uh, tourism and uh, also the impact of your free trade zones on your industrial policy? Tourism? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you see, uh, it, it of course it's impacting uh, negatively the, our internal tourism. Uh, we, we are not worried about uh, uh, our expenditure abroad in tourism. I think that is, Brazil was a very isolated country and uh, this integration is very uh, uh, positive. Uh, I, I don't think on, on the n a negative uh, uh, side to to spend uh, exchange uh, with uh, tourism abroad. I think that that's good. What is impacting uh, negatively is the the the, the uh, uh, Brazil's cost. The, 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 the fare of a, a hotel in Brazil now is, is very high. Th that's difficult. Okay, uh, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'll make it just a couple on the, on the tourism side, just a just a stab because I don't have the data because I haven't looked at the sector specifically, but clearly, you know, the costs of tourism for foreigners coming to Brazil has grown markedly with the valuation of the real. So I would suspect that you're not getting as much inflows from foreign tourists coming to Brazil. But I think the tourism sector within the country continues to grow primarily because of the phenomena of the growth of the middle class. Yeah. So when you have a huge portion of the population that has a higher disposable income to be able to actually spend and travel on airfare and going to hotels and travel within the country, that has more than made up for the potential shortfall of, of influx of foreign tourists given the strengthening of the rail, right? But, um, but, the, but the cost of tourism in, in Brazil are, are quite, uh, or at least uh, are, are quite stark. It just just uh, a quick joke that I heard when I was in Sao Paulo, uh, talking about the, the cost of traveling within Brazil in terms of what's the new paradigm right now, that if you are essentially, um, if you are uh, a, uh, a lower class, you end up going to Miami to travel. Because actually, because it's, it's cheaper to go to Miami and spend your vacation in Miami than it is to go to the Northeast, right? If you're middle class, you go to New York, a little bit more sophisticated. Hello? Yeah. And if you're rich, you go to Brazil's Northeast for a vacation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go to that qu question here, and you're coming this way, yes? Thank you very much. Uh, David Nelson from GE. Um, two, uh, two, quick, two quick issues. One. One is the, my first question is on the local content issue, which, which was very important and I, I, and I, and I appreciate the discussion of it, but I wonder if it reflects to some degree a, a concept of production from 30 or 40 years ago when you know, a, a car was made in one country and identified as that. The, the paradigm today for industrial production is a widget is made here and a widget is made there and they're put together in a third place and they go somewhere else. It's very difficult, if not impossible, for governments to decide where the most efficient place to produce each of those widgets is. And it varies from item to item. Brazil's an extremely attractive investment location, being close to your customer, if nothing else. But when you impose requirements of 60% or 70% local content, or whatever the percent is for, for a given item, it, it not only increases the cost, 
to Petrobras with the trade-offs that you talked about and reduction in, in productivity, but it, um, it, it limits the viability of, the, of developing that industry in the future because you're not going to be the most productive possible platform for production since you have required as opposed to encourage. The alternative policy is to encourage local content by developing the, the uh, skills and talents and, and abilities locally. So that's the, my comment, if you will. And the question on, is, that, is on a slightly different issue, um, which is the Dutch disease. And the, expect, the exchange rate obviously is affected by the, by the real value of the real now. But also, given the capacity of, of capital markets to anticipate the future, and the anticipation of the petroleum boom in, in Brazil. I've heard nothing really about how Brazil is prepared to deal with the, um, the anticipated huge inflows of petroleum income and the impact on the exchange rate that will make uh, manufacturing even less competitive. I think let, let's try to keep our, both our questions and our answers kind of concise so everybody has a chance to. Uh, would you like to comment on that, any, any of you, on Dutch disease, oil? Dutch disease? <laughs> John. Well, it clearly uh, is a uh, major problem. Um, I, I agreed very much with uh, what uh, Chris Garman said about uh, the dangers of uh, pushing a local content requirement um, and the fact that that's going to... Uh, but the, the Dutch disease essentially, uh, w one um, uh, needs to, uh, the way to overcome that is to make clear that in ca periods when the, the, uh, the balance of payments is in great surplus, mm -hmm. that there will be a fiscal surplus and a, 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 um, a, that will be invested abroad. And th that uh, in turn means that the exchange rate can remain reasonable and uh, uh, the uh, manufacturing can remain competitive. I, I think that's the essential uh, uh, answer to your question, that one needs uh, to, to um, uh, make clear that there will be a, um, uh, a policy of uh, taking much of the oil money and using it to uh, in invest abroad um, uh, through a sovereign wealth fund or whatever um, when the time comes. And that, that's a way to keep down the hair now. Um, I agree that uh, uh, foreign exchange markets are capable of looking ahead. Uh, they're, not, they're not always very good at it, they were happily financed in Greece up to about two weeks before the, they got an honest government in Greece, which announced the size of the problem. But uh, uh, it is foreseeable what's going to happen in Brazil. And uh, the, there is, an, therefore, a need to make clear that it's not going to uh, lead to a decimation of manufacturing industry. Yeah, just just a just a small then quick follow up. I actually think that, in terms of the local content, you know, policies in the in the oil and gas sector, we're we're going to have a couple different phases. Right now, the the mood in Brasilia is that they have to provide an unequivocal signal that you're going to have a very high local content and local reserve market in order to be able to attract the the the, the types of investments that can generate an economies of scale to make the o local oil service industry competitive. And so I think that the mood in Brasilia is we have to be very aggressive in local content rules. Now, the next phase that we're going to see, I think, over the next four or five years is that policymakers are going to have to decide what segments of the oil service and gas industry do they actually want to be competitive in, right? Because that segment is fragmented across the different countries. That debate has not yet begun. But my suspicion is that will begin once, if and when we see production not growing in the same rates that that, that, that the, the Energy Planning Agency and Petrobras is forecasting. When that trade-off becomes more acute, then you're going to have a refinement of the industrial policy. But I think, that's, I think we're going to go uh, in stages by that. Uh, the, I'd like to, to comment that that's all uh, our uh, policy plan in Brazil, our uh, means. The, 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 the idea to have a plan is exactly to, to, to have this balance, a very uh, clever balance. Otherwise, we, 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 uh, we wouldn't have Plano Brasil Maior. The idea of having the plan 
It's, it's just to have a, a very clever and and uh, and uh, uh, a very uh, 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 balanced uh, for that. Uh, otherwise, it it, it to, yeah. we have no need to do that to to have the plan. We were, we are having the plan because of that. N not to, uh, we have to. Uh, uh, all, all, all sort of uh, voluntarism would be bad, and just free market would be bad as well. Then we have to find the balance. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, automotive sector, we are just going to use the NAFTA, the, the uh, 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 criteria. The United States, Mexico, and Canada is uh, already using a local content policy for the auto, automotive sector. You are trying to, to do the same, exactly the same criteria. It's not different from the, the, uh, the, the region criteria. I think our, uh, uh, our policy, uh, the me our metrics is, 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 is not so good as you have here. We will try to, to, to do that. We are not doing anything different. Of course, uh, uh, the the uh, the fact that uh, the automotive industry is a world industry matters to 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 set what's the limit of local content. That that's it. It's not different from what we are doing here. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Now let me put Teresa Terminacion here, please. Then then we go there, and then we come here, and we come here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, a couple of uh, comments uh, on. Uh, very interesting presentation. First of all, uh, I mean, sure, the uh, appreciation of the real has been important in yeah. uh, determining the loss of competitiveness of Brazilian industry. But uh, let's face it, uh, the increase in labor costs over the last few years has been dramatic. And this is partly uh, the reflection of policies, of domestic policies, including the policy with respect to the minimum wage, which has had a demonstration effect effect throughout the, the wage structure. Uh, th the other point is that, I mean, I couldn't agree more, of course, particularly where I come from, uh, having been in the past the director of the fiscal affairs department of the IMF, uh, uh, as well as having dealt with Brazil for a long time. Um, I couldn't agree more with John Williamson that uh, uh, Brazil now needs uh, a better balanced uh, um, fiscal uh, monetary policy mix. Yeah. But and I was pleased to hear that uh, at least the government has a target of uh, coming to a uh, balanced budget by 2014. But quite frankly, I don't believe this target because uh, you don't I mean, believe. No, I don't believe this target. I don't believe that this target is feasible to, to uh, because uh, what you need is uh, uh, fundamental changes in uh, policies. I mean, you have uh, already in the, in the pipeline policies regarding. Of course, in desirable increase in, in public infrastructure, and hopefully this will be reflected in the budget, at least in, uh, in, in good part, and not put in some, we, through some uh, sort we're, of... We are not doing that. Uh, uh, tricks we are not doing under, that. It's not true. Table, okay? Sorry, we are not doing that. We have, we have to, okay. to, to prove that. Otherwise, that's I mean, that difficult. I, I think, I think if you say our figures are real, well, we are not manipulating the figures. Well, you Th this, know, this sort of discussion, I, I don't accept. Well, you know, I don't let, accept. Let, let me say it's that not, it's, that's not a, a good environment to discuss lot, about a, that. A lot, a lot of financing I don't accept that. that happens through uh, 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 you know, financing of BNDES, which is below the line. What? The, the government provides loans to BNDES. And that's BNDES that's BNDES our political BNDES. decision. Yes, the yes, government yes, has no, the legitimacy no, to do it's that. Not, it's not, you know, I, I don't object to that. All I'm saying is that this uh, means that it's not reflected above l the line in the figures of the budget deficit. Why not so, no, prove that? No, because it is below the line. It is below the line. Uh, well, uh, I uh, anyway, uh, I mean, the, the other point is that uh, uh, there is, I mean, uh, as long as you have a policy as you have now of increasing uh, pensions in, uh, uh, in line with, I mean, minimum pensions, which are the large part of uh, the pensions of the uh, uh, um, uh, pension system, in, uh, uh, in line with the minimum wage, and the minimum wage is increased in line with the uh, uh, 
you know, the, the nominal GDP, and uh, you're going to have, uh, a, 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 you know, big pressure on pensions continuing to, uh, to happen. And I mean, I certainly think it was very good that uh, uh, the, the, the Senate passed uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the law uh, uh, that it just passed, but as you said, this is not going to have an immediate, uh, an immediate impact. An immediate impact could be had with a, a reform of the pension system that uh, 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 allowed pensions to be increased just in line with prices as opposed to wages. This would have an, a major effect. And then you are, uh, you are going to uh, uh, try to increase uh, uh, the uh, tax concessions. So this will moderate the increase uh, in, uh, in, in revenues in, in, in the future. So all of these things m make me, unfortunately, quite skeptical about the possibility for, for Brazil to uh, reach the uh, you know, targeted uh, uh, balance in the, in the, in the budget. Thank okay, you. Okay, Chris first. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly share you know, uh, the, the, the concern in terms of you know, the the structure and rigidity of Brazil's fiscal expenditures and how this is a real bottleneck. I mean, I, you know, I, I share that completely. I, I, I would add a couple caveats, however, um, to, to um, the way you demonstrated your concerns. Number one, I do think it's interesting, and I'm convinced that President Dilma Rousseff is fiscally more conservative than Lula. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and I don't, I don't think it's, I think it's very revealing that when she assumed office, she announced a spending cuts to the budget of 50 billion reais. Now, a lot, half of that are not real cuts. I understand that. Um, and she repeated that pledge this year. I think that she earnestly understands that you need to have a tight stance on fiscal policy to try to help alleviate pressures on monetary policy. Now, the predicament is, is that she's dealing with certain constraints, and the minimum wage rule is a very important one. I fully agree that, you, that she has sanctified in law the rule that you readjust the national minimum wage according to inflation plus GDP growth of two years prior, and that generates inbuilt expenditure growth, particularly on the pensions, because that's the minimum pension benefit, and you generate wage pressures in the private sector. That is a problem that the government's going to have to live with. Now, what is the strategy that I sense within government to deal with that? is that they're going to squeeze increases to public sector workers. <laughs> and they have, uh, Lula granted three scaled increases. She has given almost no increases in year one. She's not giving increases in year two. And that's going to be one of the more important b political battle lines of her administration, because if you look at the, the expenditures of public payroll, the share of GDP, it has leveled off and starting to drop. <laughs> so that is one of the, the and also she's going to squeeze amendments to, to legislators. So I think that the big battle line next year is going to be public sector unions seeing that they're going to see their private counterparts getting high w w real wage increases, and they're not getting the, you know, a sweet deal anymore, all right? And, and I think that if she contains, maintains that, that, that tight fiscal stance and you still have revenue growth growing, I actually think that, that maybe those forecasts are actually quite, I mean, they're, they're within the realm of possibility, yes, I think so even despite the constraints that you highlighted before. So I, again, but I think that the, 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 the variable is revenue growth <laughs> to make those, you know, and, and, and you could have upsides on that side that associated with, uh, with the new invoicing and tax collection mechanisms. I think that the revenue department still thinks that there's a lot of upside there. So anyway, um, without yes. discarding some of your concerns, I, I, I think that the forecasts are not that unrealistic. Yeah, what, what Chris has just described allows you to see, foresee more problems for President Dilma Rousseff with her base. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so it was, we are so nice that now things are getting tougher. We ask for our woman, first woman president to deal with that. <laughs> there are all those men creating problems for her in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one, one uh, additional thing is that uh, uh, you are uh, take advantage of our uh, demographic uh, bonus. This is why we have a, a surplus in, in social pension, in the private sector of social pension. Uh, if, you, if you look at these data, these figures, you see that, uh, you see, to the minimum wage is a political uh, policy. The, this government was elected, elected to do that, reduce inequality, to eliminate uh, uh, poverty, this is our main task. Then we, we, we won't give up this, this policy. This is, is decisive policy. It's the main policy of the government. Then the, the, this is one 
that, that is not a variable. It's something that is fixed for the government. I'd like to, to make this very clear. And we were elected to do that. Mm -hmm. We have leg legitimacy to do that, and it is fair and socially uh, uh, needed. We have a mass consumption as an economic result of that. I, I have already shown that, the results. Then uh, 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 we won't have a fiscalist uh, 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 approach about that. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not the idea. Okay. And we have to look at the bonus aspect, uh, the, the, the population bonus, the, the demographic bonus, that this is why uh, we have surplus in the uh, social pension uh, uh, system, in the private one, because we have a, a very large uh, uh, workforce base. Otherwise, you are right in this respect. You would be able to do that. The, the, the real problem uh, in related to the budget is real, the, the, the public uh, 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 social uh, uh, system. Then this is not easy. We have to face that. The, the, the room for maneuver in fiscal terms is, is quite narrow. Okay. I think this is really a, a challenge, and I think I think she's doing the do the job. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that uh, she's right. Thank you. Let's go here. A short question. Please. Thank you, Mr. Spanagidis of Sinova International. I appreciate very much the presentation of Mr. Lemos and also his work previously at Cedeplar. I was disappointed, however, that is the first time that I heard a speaker from the state of Minas Gerais that did not say that Minas Gerais state is larger than France. So <laughs> I, I, I'll go back and I, I'll I, check I, on I, that. I, I want to make sure that this is, uh, Paolo, this is for the record. My question is, there was not much mention, uh, uh, Lemos, in the plan of the linkages with the agricultural sector, agro-industrial sector, which is such a dynamic sector in Brazil, and uh, both in terms of input demand and also in terms of its contribution to consumption and also in the surplus of international trade and its relation to the other BRICS, which is comparative advantage of Brazil, if you'd like to comment on that. Thank you. Let me uh, pick back uh, one question to that model, because he's talking about investments in the agro sector, of which I assume it is very, it's very efficient, very good. But there is one area where it is affected by other policies. The concern with inflation has led the government to keep uh, prices of gasoline artificially low. Uh, which is, I don't think that the people at Petrobras like that very much. I don't think that it's very good in environmental terms, and I know that the sugarcane ethanol <laughs> industry really doesn't like that because it makes their life much more difficult. So in answering his question, if you could comment a little bit on that, is there, uh, you know, are we going to at some point uh, do something with uh, gasoline prices in Brazil allow them to rise a bit and make uh, more room for our very good biofuels industry to have more space and actually promote the Brazil as a good environmental citizen of the world. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, very valuable uh, comment. Uh, I, in general, I used to 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 start my speech uh, abroad uh, uh, saying about uh, Minas Gerais and my uh, small town. That that was a. You see, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, rec this recollection. That is important. <laughs> uh, uh, re uh, regarding uh, agribusiness. Uh, sector, uh, uh, we think uh, 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 from the viewpoint of the plan that the, the, the main, uh, uh, our main focus is on logistic. The, 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 the agribusiness in Brazil is going very well. Uh, per se, it, it, it doesn't need a specific uh, policy, but the logistic uh, aspect is, we think that is decisive. Then uh, our uh, uh, of our uh, effort is concentrated on uh, 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 integrated uh, the uh, Plano Brasil Maior with the PAC, the, the, the infrastructure plan, uh, towards uh, a better uh, uh, logistic in the, the 
the north and the the uh, uh, and in, in the the center west because where is the the cerrado uh, lands and uh, this is uh, uh, for uh, for us is critical for exports and for the the competitiveness of our agribusiness then this is uh, our main uh, focus uh, 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 related to 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 agribusiness and i'd like to say that uh, we are just uh, uh, developing a long uh, uh, run ethanol policy uh, because you see th this uh, this uh, running policy is over you are uh, quite right uh, paulo uh, we, we 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 can't have a, a a ethanol policy that is based on a relative uh, price between ethanol and gasoline it it doesn't work uh, so 20 years ago, yes, it, it was all right. And now that we will have an uh, oil surplus, this is another reality, and we have to change the policy. Then we are going to do that. The main uh, uh, aim of this long-term ethanol policy is towards uh, 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 transforming uh, our uh, ethanol industry into a, a, a commodity a, a, a production to the world. I think this is the main point. And, and probably we'll have to eliminate uh, hydroethanol. Uh, uh, probably some th we have to, to think seriously about this new uh, uh, direction of the ethanol policy. Of course, it will, it will uh, reach directly uh, uh, agribusiness. This is an important part of our uh, agribusiness now, even including the, the center west, is the, the, the uh, ethanol uh, uh, business. Okay, uh, here, question. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, my name is Wilson Frota from the World Bank. Uh, uh, I just wanted to comment. I'm very happy that uh, the skills and education component is an integral part of the Plan of Brazil Mayor. I think that's really the, the silver bullet. You, you can have all the technology advancements, if you don't have people who are able to operate the new machines, you're not going to go anywhere. So long term, that's one of the major structural obstacles. But And then you have a supply side for that and a demand side for that. We're working on the supply, the quality of education, but how do you work on the demand side? How do we actually make people want to work in manufacturing? If with so many competing demands, like you say the, the middle class is increasing and then people want, what they, they want to go to college because the expected returns are higher, so they're going to go to maybe a low-quality university and get a business degree and go try and find a job instead of getting a high-quality technical secondary education and work in manufacturing. So is this a concern, and, and how are you addressing it? Uh, my approach is, is, is very uh, based on economics in, in this respect. I, I, I'd say that uh, if uh, a a guy from the Ministry of Education, uh, 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 we're here, uh, he would say something uh, a little bit different. But uh, in this case, my, my, my view is, is purely uh, uh, a economic view. And I think, uh, you see, uh, if you look at the, the trend of uh, uh, the, the real wage curve, in Brazil, and if you, uh, uh, you if you make a decomposition of this curve into several uh, level uh, of uh, uh, education, uh, for example, by schooling years, uh, you you can see that the 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 the, the growth rate of the uh, of increasing in real ra wages is more concentrated. In, in technical uh, 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 skills and, and technical occupations. Then you see the real wage of these guys is, is, uh, is uh, they, they have this, uh, uh, about uh, uh, tw uh, 12 years of uh, schooling. Uh, is increasing higher and faster than uh, 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 high education. Then I think this will uh, balance the demand. Uh, uh, this is a very economic view, but I, I believe that because uh, if you look at these curves 
uh, uh, it's clear that the payoff for a guy to stop uh, uh, in, 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 the, in its uh, uh, 12 years uh, of schooling and, and go to the, 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 the job market, uh, uh, his payoff probably w will be better. You see, that then it's changing Brazil, and and, and then I, I think this is the the, the 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 main explanation. That's why we are we are so uh, concentrated uh, on 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 uh, uh, media education, not to uh, the focus of the policy is not uh, 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 higher education is basic education, first point. I have no doubt that uh, uh, formal. Schooling in basic education in Brazil is decisive, mainly the, not, not the coverage, but the quality mm -hmm. of basic education. And, and middle education, uh, this is decisive. Uh, the other, on the other hand, a, 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 a science without border program, uh, you, you have heard about it. Uh, I think this program is for higher education. And the, the idea is uh, uh, to, to link this uh, uh, training abroad. And I, I like this very much. Uh, I was trained abroad, and I think the benefits uh, are, are huge. You see, I, I believe very much in, in, in a, a global training. I think it works a lot. And I think this idea for higher education is the best way to deal with a, a higher education training. Thank you. Well, let's collect a few of the remaining questions, please, here. Then you. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Brian Hansen. I'm a graduate student at George Mason University. I'm interested in how much of the uh, Plano Brasil Mayor is going to rely on foreign direct investment uh, to help support some of these innovative manufacturing uh, that you, you, you talked about earlier, specifically from China or other East Asian countries? Yeah, just hold on, I'll let you see. Uh, is there anyone else? No. Uh, Hugh Schwartz. I taught in Curitiba uh, during the late 90s. Yes. Um, I was going to take the panel, uh, while appreciating what I learned from the panel, uh, I was going to take them to task for not having uh, spoken sufficiently of uh, education and the demands of education in contributing to a successful industrial policy, particularly in the context of overvaluation. But this has just changed in response <laughs> to the last uh, question. I would just say that uh, why don't you say something about the extent to which the Brazilian government uh, and, the, and the states are dedicating more attention to the quality of secondary school education generally, as well as uh, uh, technical education Yes, uh, I would like uh, to invite you, Mauro, to uh, answer the questions. And if Chris and John have final comments also, please, you're welcome. If you're almost out of time. Well, first of all, we won't change our uh, uh, foreign uh, direct investment policy. I think it's sound. We should do that. We want to uh, close the country. It's, uh, it would be a, a serious mistake that's not uh, uh, the government uh, uh, policy. Then it's, it should be open and more open uh, as usual. Uh, uh, regarding uh, secondary school education, the, the, what uh, our program is, uh, uh, what is called a PRONATEC, is a professionalization of a secondary uh, uh, schooling. Uh, this program is very difficult to implement. Very difficult. I think this, uh, uh, for me, is the most important challenge, challenging uh, uh, now for for our uh, uh, policy implementation. Uh, the shift uh, uh, from uh, 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 traditional secondary schools to professional uh, uh, technical schools is, is, is really very difficult because we have the problem of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the labor force uh, uh, supply, teachers. <laughs> how to suddenly to have, uh, uh, from the supply side, how to, to get enough teachers 
qualified to do that. Then in, sh in the short run, it's very difficult. This transition is not easy. Then I think this is really the, 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 a, a big passion for us. Well, uh, do you, yes, Just Chris. One, one small uh, kind of comment also on education policy, which is, which is critical, of course. I think that you know, this administration, prior administrations have taken important advances in, in trying to be able to bolster you know, lower education, middle education, although there is a dysfunctionality and inefficiency inherent in the education system which remains, which is that you essentially provide free public education for, for let's say, university level. And, and the profile of the students that receive the free university education are usually upper class individuals. These are families that can pay for a very good middle yeah. schooling, private schooling. They're the only ones that get in. So you're essentially having a fiscal transfer from the state and taxpayers to upper class. Right? It's an and, unequal and policy. And yes. It's a very, it's a, it's, you know, it's, it, it drains resources. And what you should do is you should, should, should charge tuition and use that money to invest in the education system further. Yeah. Well, that, that hasn't even begun to enter the political debate at all. Yeah. Once again, I agree with Chris yeah. Garman, but uh, let me <clears throat> also make some remark about FDI. I, I agree that the, it should remain open, uh, but I think that it's important to recognize what is not always done in countries from which the FDI comes, that it's, a purely se it's quite secondary. Um, it's under 10% of investment in Brazil is financed by FDI. And it, primarily, the country is going to advance on its own um, investments. And uh, that's right. That's the way it is. Well, uh, with that, I just wanted to give you a reminder. I was very happy to mention in your PowerPoint model of the Buy Dole Act of 1980, which is the law approved in the United States when Americans thought that the, Chi the Japanese were just going to overrun the country. And they decided that uh, they would have to change their, the way they dealt with patent laws by allowing uh, the inventors, the creators, the scientists that work at public research institutes here in the United States to benefit from the fruit of their invention. The by, uh, Evan Bayh and Bob Dole law, a uh, dem Democrat and a Republican when there was much more of that in Washington at those times. Uh, and they produced this law. Actually, we had here uh, last April, a year ago, a group of 18 Brazilian congressmen from eight different parties. We had, we did a congressional study group on innovation with them three days here at the State Department at MIT. And uh, I remember the reaction of some Brazilian congressmen, when they were informed about that historic fact, and they were all became immediately interested, saying, could we do that in Brazil? I'm very happy <laughs> to see it there. Yeah. Actually, I'm leaving today because on Monday, we are going to have the second Brazilian congressional study mission on innovation, this time in London, uh, to see what, uh, what uh, they, are, they are doing in, uh, in that. So, uh, and innovation is very much part, as Roberto uh, knows very well, has been very much part of our program here. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, Mauro Borges Lemos very much for uh, coming to the Wilson Center uh, and uh, share, to share with us uh, the, 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 uh, this initiative by the Brazilian government also to thank very much uh, John and Chris for taking time to enrich the discussion. And I particularly thank all of you for being here. Stay tuned. Check our programs. We will try to continue to bring discussions that are relevant to Brazil, to Brazilian public policy making, to Brazil uh, and U.S. Uh, policy uh, uh, relations. The next stop, obviously, will be when President Dilma Rousseff visits Washington on uh, April 9th. We, were, we are co-hosts of a major event happening at the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, and there will be actually one important element of the conference will be Science Without Border, another one, Innovation. 
So uh, check on our website at the Chamber, Brazil, U.S. Business Council, uh, I think, uh, and the President will uh, address uh, uh, the conference at the end. Uh, it is all being put together uh, by the Brazilian government with our collaboration, a great participation and help of the Brazilian Embassy here in town. Thank you very much. Stay tuned and come back. This is your home.